This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the only web platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in just a bit. You're probably familiar with Roman emperors such as Augustus or Trajan, men who ascended to the throne and took the Roman Empire to new heights. You've probably also heard of rulers such as Nero, Commodus, or Caligula, the ones who abused their power and treated Rome as a personal playground where they were free to satisfy their most depraved vices. These are usually the two groups of emperors that get the most attention, the ones that sit at opposite ends of the spectrum. But where exactly does Domitian fit in? If we go strictly by ancient sources, then that's easy. He's firmly in the second camp, the one filled with maniacs and deviants. Suetonius, Cassio Dio, and Tacitus all wrote about Domitian. They portrayed him as a vicious, paranoid, and power-hungry tyrant. But as you're about to find out, many of them also had personal grudges against him. So perhaps they might not have been paragons of objectivity when they wrote about him. Most historians tend to have a more lenient view of the emperor. They don't deny his ruthlessness and autocracy, but they think these were mixed in with efficiency, realism, practicality, and a genuine desire to improve Rome, with the end result being one of the most contentious and controversial reigns in the history of the Roman Empire. Domitian was born Titus Flavius Domitianus on October 24, 51 AD, part of the short-lived Flavian dynasty that ruled the Roman Empire for three decades during the second half of the first century. His father was Vespasian, a crucial emperor who brought much-needed stability to Rome following the civil war caused by the Year of Four Emperors, and who may also even have saved the empire from collapsing just a hundred years into its existence. And if you'd like to learn all about that hot mess, we have a biographics video on Vespasian ready for your viewing pleasure. Domitian's mother was Domitilla the Elder, who died sometime before her husband became emperor. He had an older sister named, you guessed it, Domitilla the Younger, who also died before her family took power. Domitian married once in 71 AD to Domitia Longina. The couple had one son together who died young. So let's finish the family tree with Domitian's older brother Titus, who ascended to the Roman throne after their father's death. It'd be pretty fair to say that many Romans, Vespasian included, looked to Titus to carry on the family name. Domitian grew up in the shadow of his brother, who had clearly been groomed and trained to take over the empire one day. Vespasian even trusted his eldest son enough to lead the charge on the first Jewish-Roman war. Therefore, nobody was really surprised when Titus named the new heir, and he later became emperor. By most accounts, Titus had a positive start to his reign, even when he was faced with the worst natural disaster in Roman history, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, which we covered on a geographics video we did about Pompeii, if you're interested in learning more about that. However, all hopes of a long, successful reign quickly left when Titus fell ill with a fever and died suddenly in 81 AD, just two years after becoming emperor. Despite the fact that Domitian had previously only held ceremonial titles and never really had any actual responsibility, he was now the Emperor of Rome. There was no love lost between these two brothers. Suetonius accused Domitian of openly plotting against his sibling and then leaving him for dead once Titus fell ill, seemingly more concerned with his ascension to the throne than his brother's well-being. Even when Domitian was emperor and Titus was dead and buried, the sibling rivalry continued as Domitian bestowed no honor upon him save that of deification and he often assailed his memory in ambiguous phrases both in his speeches and in his edicts. Domitian wasted no time in becoming drunk with power. Almost as soon as he took the throne, he gave himself the modest title of Dominius et Deus, or Master and God, and made the Senate almost redundant by severely curtailing their powers. The two sides remained at odds with each other for all of Domitian's reign. The emperor made no secret of the fact that he considered the Senate an obsolete remnant of a bygone era, and that he alone should be the one making all of the decisions that would lead Rome into a new and glorious age. 
This is the main reason why ancient historians were so rough in their treatment of Domitian, since many were senators themselves or were around in that same social strata. Suetonius, a contemporary of Domitian, describes the emperor as rapacious through need and cruel through fear, while Cassius Dio said that Domitian was not only bold and quick to anger, but also treacherous and secretive, and that there was no human being for whom he felt any genuine affection, but he always pretended to be fond of the person whom, at the moment, he most desired to slay. All that being said, Suetonius does give credit where it's due and admits that Domitian had a very hands-on approach when it came to ruling over his empire. You might be familiar with other power-mad emperors who basically treated Rome as their personal piggy bank, preferring banquets instead of budgets and orgies instead of oversight. But it doesn't seem that Domitian fell into that category. He enacted many new laws, policies, and edicts, and got involved in all aspects of administration. And we're not saying they were necessarily good or improvements over the previous system, we're just saying that there were a lot of them. For starters, Domitian fought against nepotism and did not award many officers to his family members, even though this was a common occurrence at the time, practiced even by his father, Vespasian. More than that, he opens many political offices to freedmen and equestrians when such important positions were typically reserved only for the senatorial classes. He also ensured that justice was dispensed with diligence by sitting on many tribunal hearings, targeting jurors and arbiters who were accused of accepting bribes. It seems that the suspicious nature and slight paranoia that usually accompanies a man in his position of power worked in Domitian's favor, because the level of scrutiny he enacted over his underlings kept corruption at a minimum. Even Suetonius had to admit that he took such care to exercise restraint over the city officials and the governors of the provinces, that at no time were they more honest or just, whereas after his time we have seen many of them charged with all manner of offenses. Another curious aspect that goes against the whole mad emperor persona was that Domitian seemed to be a bit of a prude. When it comes to Roman emperors, we're used to hearing about all the weird sex stuff that they were into. But if Domitian had a freaky side, he kept it very well hidden. Outwardly, he clamped down on licentious behavior and released guidelines for strict morals. He forbade public theater as well as satire aimed at distinguished men and women. He openly condemned high-ranking officials who were caught with their pants down, both literally and metaphorically, and he enacted capital punishments on vestal virgins found guilty of breaking their chastity vows. The only juicy bit of scandal from Domitian's private life comes to us courtesy of Cassius Dio, who said that the emperor's wife, Domitia, had an affair with an actor named Paris. Once Domitian found out, he had Paris murdered in the street and intended to put his wife to death as well, until he was talked out of it by an advisor. He and Domitia became estranged, and the emperor started a new relationship with a niece named Julia. Now, just before we continue with today's video, a quick word from today's wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. Look, it's the age of creation. Think about it. Everyone is out there on the internet making something. We're no longer just reading blogs or listening to podcasts or watching YouTube. We're increasingly making these things. So you've probably either got a great idea yourself or you know someone who does and when it's time to move that project from your head to the screen in front of you that's where squarespace comes in it's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you want it to be maybe you're the hands-on type lots of opinions and ideas about exactly what your site should look like great squarespace got all the customization tools you could ever want with no technical bs to worry about or maybe you just need something functional something that works with minimal thought so you could focus on your content rather than just the coat of paint if so, good news, Squarespace has tons of beautiful templates that you can use. And once you're done setting up your website, there are many extra features on Squarespace so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, everything you could ever want is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next big project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, you got to do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to it.
When Domitian wasn't busy passing laws and making edicts, he was rebuilding Rome. The Eternal City had seen better days, having suffered one civil war and two major fires in the previous decades, including the Great Fire of 64 during Nero's time, which destroyed most two-thirds of the city. But this was a costly and time-consuming endeavor, and Domitian was not satisfied with merely making Rome the same way it used to be. He had his own ambitious construction plans to give it the grandeur that he felt it deserved. For starters, he finished two major building projects started by his father and brother. One was the Temple of Vespasian and Titus, and the other was the famed Colosseum, or the Flavian Amphitheater, as it was called back then. Then he renovated some of Rome's greatest structures, which had been damaged in the prior century, such as the Circus Maximus and the Pantheon. Finally, Domitian had his master architect, Riberius, design a new palace for himself and build it on top of the Palatine Hill, a palace of unimaginable opulence and extravagance that would be the envy of all of Rome. He called this architectural marvel the Flavian Palace, and indeed it lived up to its reputation, so much so that subsequent emperors continued to use it as their residence even after the Flavian dynasty was long gone. Temples also greatly benefited from Domitian's attention as the emperor was a devout man who regularly offered praise to the gods, particularly Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and justice. Domitian oversaw the fourth and final reconstruction of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, making it bigger and more spectacular than ever. This was the oldest and most sacred temple in Rome, but it had a tendency to get damaged a lot. Domitian's father, Vespasian, had just rebuilt it for the third time, and it only lasted a few years before burning down again. Domitian's renovation seemed to be more sturdy, as the temple lasted for hundreds of years until the Romans turned to Christianity and stopped caring about it. To show his devoutness, as well as score some bonus points with the common people, Domitian regularly organized games, fights, and races where he presided at the competitions in half boots clad in a purple toga in the Greek fashion and wearing upon his head a golden crown with figures of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, while by his side sat the priest of Jupiter and the College of the Flavials, similarly dressed, except that their crowns bore his image as well. During these times, Domitian awarded the people gifts of money and threw lavish banquets because he knew the secret to a long reign. Between the people, the army, and the senate, you needed to keep at least two of the three happy in order to avoid being dragged through the streets and ripped to pieces by an angry mob. The senate was out of the question, so Domitian ensured that he never got on the bad side of the soldiers or the plebeians. If you're going to have a large army of well-paid soldiers, you might as well use it, right? Well, that was Domitian's thinking, and he went on the warpath very early in his reign, likely since he considered military glory to be an essential component of the new and improved Roman Empire he was working on. His first target was a Germanic tribe called the Shati, although his campaign didn't really receive the reception that he was hoping for. In 83 AD, Domitian used a very flimsy pretext to declare war on the Shati, and he founded a new legion called Legio Minervia to take them on. He easily scored some early victories, enough to return home to Rome, and just justify throwing a military triumph in his own honor, but historians of his time decried his war as uncalled for and a mock triumph. It was very much like the biggest bully in class beating up the dorky kid who ate paste and then bragging about it to all of his friends. Tacitus made no secret of the fact that Domitian's actions were motivated by jealousy of a general named Agricola, who was in charge of the Roman conquest of Britain and was out there winning some actual victories while the emperor was merely play-fighting. Quote, he felt conscious that all men laughed at his late mock triumph over Germany, for which there had been purchased from traders people whose dress and hair might be made to resemble those of captives, whereas now a real and splendid victory with the destruction of thousands of the enemy was being celebrated with just applause. It was, he thought, a very alarming thing for him that the name of a subject should be raised above that of the emperor. Tacitus was also Agricola's son-in-law, so perhaps there's a tiny bit of bias there, but there's no denying the Domitian eventually put a stop to Agricola's career without just cause, recalling him to Rome in 85 AD and then refusing to give him another military post, even though Agricola had been a successful commander since the time of Vespasian. In 87 AD, Domitian ended the campaign in Britain altogether, abandoning the Caledonian territories, dismantling the fortifications, and moving the Roman border further south. His plan soon became evident because Domitian had set his sights on a new, ambitious target. The Kingdom of Dacia. 
As early as 85 AD, the Dacians had begun conducting raids into Moesia, their neighboring Roman province. The attacks took on a more threatening nature when the Dacians met the Romans in battle and actually won, even killing the governor of their province, Oppius Sabinus, in the process. Clearly, a stronger military presence was needed to respond to this threat, which is why Domitian ordered his troops from Britain to withdraw and travel to Moesia. He assumed that five Roman legions, led by General Colinius Fuscus, would be more than enough to handle the puny barbarian invaders, but he was wrong because the Dacians were led by their greatest ever commander, King Decebalus. Cassius Dio certainly seemed to have more respect for him than he ever did for Domitian, and he described Decebalus as shrewd in his understanding of warfare and shrewd also in the waging of war. He judged well when to attack and chose the right moment to retreat. He was an expert in ambassades and a master in pitched battles, and he knew not only how to follow up a victory well, but also how to manage well a defeat. Hence he showed himself a worthy antagonist of the Romans for a long time. When Fuscus launched his counter-offensive and drove the Dacians across the border, he thought the war was as good as won. Domitian had accompanied him up until that point, even though he remained behind the safety of the city walls far away from the battlefields. But now he was on his way back to Rome to prepare for his second triumph when he heard the news. Fuscus had crossed the Danube River into Dacia and walked right into an ambush. The general was killed, one of his legions was completely annihilated, and the others were forced to retreat. It was a complete humiliation for Domitian, but then it got even worse. The war continued for the next few years, with neither side gaining a decisive advantage. However, it wasn't like the Dacians were Rome's only enemy. Other tribes, such as the Marcomanni, the Quadi, and the Isiges, were all harassing Rome's borders, and Domitian simply did not have the soldiers necessary to deal with all of them. In 88 AD, the emperor had no choice but to swallow his pride and accept a peace treaty with Decebalus, which was great news for Dacia because the treaty was very much in their favor. Sure, Dacia was now a client kingdom of Rome, but the Dacians were laughing all the way to the bank as they built new fortifications and equipped their soldiers all with Roman money and engineers provided by Domitian to keep them nice and quiet. The deal worked, but both the Senate and the army considered it utterly disgraceful. It wasn't until almost 20 years later that Trajan corrected this black eye to Rome when he defeated Decebalus and conquered Dacia. Although Domitian was eventually successful in stabilizing his borders again, he never truly recovered from the war with the Dacians, which resulted in a humiliating compromise for him. Even Suetonius, someone who gave Domitian some credit in his first years as emperor, saw that the emperor went on a downward spiral where he steadily gave in to his paranoia and cruelty. The second half of Domitian's 16-year reign was marked by numerous executions. Up until that point, he was mainly content to simply neuter the Senate's power and then ignore them. But now he wanted them out of the way permanently. What followed was a purge of senators, ex-consuls, governors, and other officials who were executed for the most trivial reasons. Domitian put to death his own cousin, Flavius Sabinus, because he was once accidentally announced by a crier as emperor-elect instead of consul, while Solistius Lucullus, the governor of Britain, was executed simply for naming a new type of lance after himself. Domitian's growing paranoia certainly wasn't helped by the fact that sometimes people were actually plotting against him. One such event occurred in 89 AD, when the governor of Germania Superior, Lucius Antonius Saturnius mounted a rebellion against the emperor. Unfortunately for the upstart agitator, he was surrounded by other generals who were still loyal to Domitian, including the future emperor Trajan, and they managed to stamp out the revolt before it really led anywhere. Even so, it still presented a convenient opportunity for Domitian to execute some more people that he accused of being co-conspirators. Obviously, things couldn't go on like this forever. Everyone around Domitian lived in constant fear that they might be the next one on the chopping block. Ultimately, a new conspiracy was hatched, although the identities of all participants remain a mystery. As Suetonius tells it, the main culprit was a court steward named Stephanus, who faked an arm injury in order to conceal a dagger within the bandages. On September the 18th, 96 AD, Stephanus gained a private audience with Domitian under the pretense of having uncovered a plot to assassinate the emperor. The only tiny little detail that he forgot to mention was that he was part of the very plot. So, while Domitian was reading some documents Stephanus had handed him, the steward pulled out his dagger and stabbed the emperor right in the crotch because he'd never heard of the heart or the neck, apparently. 
Anyway, while this might have raised Mission's singing voice a few octaves, it didn't kill him, so a scuffle ensued between the two men. When other conspirators heard the commotion, they entered the Emperor's chambers and stabbed him seven more times for good measure. And thus came the end of Domitian, and with it the ends of the Flavian dynasty. He left behind a controversial legacy which could generously be described as a game of two halves. The first one, at least, filled with ambition, reform, and potential, although ultimately they were replaced with failure, tyranny, and bloodshed. Reactions to his death were mixed. Unsurprisingly, the senators were so overjoyed that they raced to fill the house where they did not refrain from assailing the dead emperor with the most insulting and stinging kind of outcries. The people of Rome didn't really seem to care that much, but that cannot be said for the soldiers who quite liked Domitian. They wanted the emperor deified and his assassins executed, which was in stark contrast to the senate's wishes, who wanted Domitian's memory to be entirely stricken from the history books. Obviously, the senate didn't get what they wanted, since we are talking about it right now, but without any heirs, they needed to select Domitian's successor very carefully in order to avoid a new civil war. And, well, they chose poorly. The new Roman emperor was Nerva, a former consul who had served the empire since the times of Nero. Don't get us wrong, Nerva seemed like a decent candidate. He was the first of the so-called five good emperors. He reverted many of Domitian's autocratic policies and swore never to execute a senator. But Nerva was already in his mid-sixties when he took the throne, and as a lifelong bureaucrat, he commanded no respect from the army. He only ruled for a year and a half, and in the middle of his reign, the Praetorian Guard revolted against him in 97 AD, took him hostage, and forced him to give up Domitian's killers to be executed. Once that happened, it was clear that any authority Nerva might have once possessed was completely gone. Truth be told, his greatest attribute might have been his ability to admit that he wasn't the right man for the job, which is why, in 98 AD, he willingly and peacefully trans transferred power to his adopted heir, who was the right man for the job, Trajan. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.